So you want to get in the booze business. We'll talk about that next. <laughs> Welcome everyone, my name is Platt. I'm a Las Vegas bartender, home brewer, and all around lover of booze. Uh, if you are a regular of this channel, thank you for coming back. Appreciate your viewership. And I think you'll like today's topic. Uh, kind of goes to my background a little bit more. Uh, it touches a topic I've, I've only briefly talked about in previous videos. If you're new to the channel, thanks for coming here. I appreciate it. And I'm going to presume that you came here because you're interested in either starting a brewery, distillery, winery, cidery, meadery, some form of alcoholic beverage company, and you're wanting to look for information. Uh, I think you came to the right place. Uh, hopefully this video will help you out. Uh, more importantly, help you uh, avoid some mistakes that I made uh, with my company. Uh, real quick before we want to get started. Get started. I want to thank a regular viewer of mine, Jose Lopez. It was his idea for this video. I had done recently a video reviewing Sam Adams' Oktoberfest, and in it I talked about the topic of contract brewing and how, uh, especially in the brewing world, it kind of gets a bad name. People kind of look down upon that. But in the video, I mentioned that the company that I once had, the spirit company I once had, we were going to have a similar arrangement, you know, as to contract brewing. We were contracting out the production of our product and I, I said that I didn't think it was as bad as people thought. Jose uh, replied in the video, hey tell us your story and I've never really talked about it fully, my spirits business fully on this channel before so I thought today I'd do this video, tell my story, more importantly tell you folks out there that are looking to get in the business the mistakes I made and uh, how to avoid them. Uh, hopefully save you uh, a lot of time and money. So first, let's start off with my story. Um, around 2010 or so, I uh, started really kind of ramping up my mad scientist thing. I was really getting back into home brewing. I think I'd bought a, another Mr. Beer kit. I started making some ciders, this, that, and the other. And around the same time, I started hanging out with some fellow Las Vegas bartenders. And we'd get together on Sundays and watch football, and we'd call them sideways Sundays because, you know, we'd keep them back and be a little sideways. And uh, each Sunday I'd come over with something new I'd made, and I'd get a thumbs up or thumbs down, depending on how it came out. And around that time, a friend had asked me, hey, have you ever heard of apple pie moonshine, and can you make apple pie moonshine? I said, well, I've never heard of it, but, you know, let me do some research. And I did a little research, kind of worked on a recipe, produced a batch, and... Everybody kind of liked it, but they're like, hey, can you add a little more cinnamon or whatever? And over the next few weeks, we kind of tweaked the recipe until finally kind of had that moment. Hey, you need to sell it. We need to sell this. We need to buy all this and sell it. Well, I knew we weren't going to sell it out of the back of our trunk or anything like that at NASCAR Weekend or anything. So I started doing a little bit of research on the licensing process, which was way more convoluted than I thought. Around this same time, I was introduced to Bert Tito Beverage, the founder of Tito's Vodka. He had come out to Vegas several times over about a year period to do different vodka seminars. And I got to meet him at these different seminars. We got to talking afterwards. And he's, you know, from Texas. I grew up in Texas. We kind of instantly kind of hit it off. And he was telling me his whole story about how he had started Tito's. And more importantly, he kind of told me how he kind of bootstrapped the operation. And I want to say he told me he had either 12 or 18 different credit cards. He was $200,000 in credit card debt at one time. I mean, he really did bootstrap the whole operation. He was the original distillery in Texas, so he had to help the legislature write new regulations because they weren't prepared for it down there. And uh, But anyway, you know, getting a no Tito really inspired me. And if you know his whole story, you know how it turned out. Uh, going Forbes magazine today, I want to say he's worth $4 billion or something. So a true inspiration, and after I got to know him, I was fired up. Let's go. Let's do it, boys. Let's form a company. We called it Sideways Sunday Spirits. That was the name of the company, and we were going to sell apple pie moonshine. We were going to live the dream. We were going to become rich like Tito. Life was going to be good. Uh, so we start off full of, you know, piss and vinegar. Uh, we started through the permit process, which I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know if you're prepared for That's a, It's a lot of work to get the different permits. One of the things we found out in the process, even when we decided to contract out the production of our spirits, 
is the TTB still needs an address for you, not just a mailing address, but they need a place where technically they can raid you. Well, you don't want to use your <laughs> home address for that then, so we had to get an office. We ended up forming our corporation not here in Nevada, but Delaware. We became a foreign corporation here. And part of that was for when you had to pay the tax, what part of the chain of custody, the spirits. It's Like I said, if you're looking to get in that business, you, you'll, you'll learn all this stuff the hard way, unfortunately. So we started that going, and again we realized, all right, now we got to start, you know, now we got some money going out. We get, let's get some money flowing. Let's, you know, start raising some money. Uh, one of the first things that we thought about and what was becoming trendy at the time was, hey, one of these crowdfunding places. We'll just, look, this brewery raised $50,000 and this place got $40,000. Man, it'll just be that easy. So we ended up starting, uh, we chose Indiegogo over Kickstarter. Uh, at the time, it may have changed, but at the time, Kickstarter, if you did not raise the full amount, let's say you were shooting for $25,000 and you raised $24,999, you did not get a dime. Your campaign failed. Or an Indiegogo, that same campaign, if you shot for $25,000 and only raised like $21,000, you got to keep the money. I think you paid a higher fee if you didn't reach the goal, but you still got some money in to help you through the process. And I can do a whole video just on that because, again, again I can tell you how not to run an Indiegogo campaign. I think we ended up only raising a few hundred dollars. It did not work out well. And unfortunately, that became a sign of things to come. Uh, the next hill we had to climb was distribution. Um, we were naive in that, and the fact that we'd been, you know, between all of us, had been in the bar business out here in Vegas for a long time. Knew a lot of people that worked for the local liquor distributors, what have you. We knew people in the liquor stores, and we thought, well, we're local. They'll want to help us. Uh, at the time, I don't think Las Vegas Distilling was open yet out here. Uh, there was a few breweries, no wineries, cideries, meanery, anything like that out here. So we just thought, well, we're one of the few local alcoholic beverage companies. Surely these folks will want to help us out. Oh, nay, nay, nay. They'll wish you well, but they're not changing their business model for you. And that's something we were not prepared for. We were not prepared for the fact that not only do you have to get them to agree to distribute your product, but you have to motivate their sales staff, if you know what I mean. Uh, also, you have to motivate the local liquor store. You'd think the guy that owns the local chain of liquor stores would want to help out a local merchant. Oh, nay, nay. Um, you want that spot on that shelf, you have to buy it. Either you buy off all the product that's on that shelf, or you give them the first case to put on that spot of the shelf. But it's more money out of your pocket. And we were just not prepared for that. Uh, we actually were settling, luckily, through some connections, we knew someone that owned a smaller distributorship that was more specialized, but he was someone that we had worked with before and knew, you know, from, from a previous job or from a job. And so uh, he said, well, if you can't get the big boys to distribute, I'll distribute. So, you know, we at least had that. Uh, and then finally what ended up getting us is what gets everybody, and it's money. Not enough money. We did not plan <laughs> for all these random expenses that came up. We were a little naive on a lot of this stuff. Um, I'll give you a good example. One of the things that we had contemplated doing was that apple pie moonshine we made tasted really, really good warm. So we thought, well, why don't we get like a Jaeger machine, but kind of reverse engineer it to where it heated up, serve it hot instead of cold. Uh, first we looked into psyche machines, but those things were expensive. But once we got into looking into the whole process, we talked to someone that ran a chain of bars out here and asked them, well, all right, how's the Jaeger machine thing work? You know, how, what did they have to do to get that? And they said, well, we're open. You know, if your product is good as you say it is and the samples you try, you know, we're open to it, but here's the deal. You have to buy the machine and give it to us. It becomes our machine, our property. Then you have to basically fill it for the first time. You know, most Jaeger machines have the three bottles. So basically you're giving them three bottles of product and that machine. I want to say those Jaeger machines now may be like $400, but I think they were more expensive back then. So let's just say that. Well, this particular bar at the time had like 30-something different locations. So they wanted me to buy 30 different machines with three free bottles of booze for all, you know, <laughs> all that. That just, that I think I projected out would have been like 10, 15% of our first run of 
you know, our first order of booze that we did our first run of product. That much just to give out for free. That's before I've given out any samples to anybody. And we just weren't prepared for that. And it was things like that that kept kind of popping up. Um, you know, just the amount of booze you need to keep off to the side that will never get sold. It's just samples. And just, it was stuff like that we weren't prepared for. Uh, also, to be honest, something you run into, you know, people, especially if you create something that truly really tastes good, people will be enthusiastic at first. Oh, I, I'm willing to pitch in X dollars, or I've got a guy who'll pitch in. Just know that X, X Mallow's people will fail, will not come through. Don't count every dollar that people says they're coming in, because it's just not going to happen. It's just the way of the world. Um, also, too, we had some people that are actually going to be larger investors uh, that kind of fell through. They didn't get the concept. Um, at the time, the whole Flavor Moonshine thing was kind of new, so it was really kind of hard to, you know, get the concept uh, to them. And then finally, we ended up losing a line of credit that was going to get us our first batch of spirits produced, get it on the shelf, and at least hopefully get some cash flow back in. Um, it fell through, and just not enough money. We just uh, let the ball drop. The company probably existed somewhere between a year, year and a half legally before we ended up returning back the license. If you fail in one of these businesses, you still have to send back the license. Make sure to do that. Um, to be honest, um, I can just speak for my own deal. Probably about a year or so after we failed, it, it, it ate me up for probably a good year plus after we failed. I'm not, I, 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 drink, I drink a lot of nights thinking about that. And uh, it's it still, Oddly enough, um, a couple years afterwards, the company that we'd contracted to make our Apple Pie Moonshine actually came out with their own Apple Pie Moonshine. Now, something uh, before any of you say, hey, you sue them, right? The, there's no trademarking, patenting, or recipes. Uh, you can make a beer that tastes exactly like Budweiser. Follow its recipe somehow if you got a hold of it. You just can't call it Budweiser. It could taste like Budweiser. You can't call it Budweiser. It's the name, it's the brand that gets trademarked and licensed and all that stuff. It's not the recipe. So I really didn't have any way to protest. We didn't get that first batch done, so I didn't have a, a, a completed contract with them on that end. There was an NDA originally when we negotiated, but because that first batch didn't go through, and again, it was just it was it was a no-win situation. I already lost enough <laughs> money on this deal, but. I could tell you for years I would see that bottle. I don't know if, if they still produce the product or not, but I would see that bottle in liquor store and my, my head would explode. Uh, real quick, so that's my story. Uh, again, a story of failure, but hopefully you made some notes. I'm like, all right, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. So next one, I, I thought I'd do the five things that I learned through this process that will hopefully help you. Uh, number one, regulation, regulation, regulation. You just, you can't imagine how regulated the alcoholic beverage business is. Um, think about like a regular business, like let's say you want to start a snow cone stand or something like that. You're going to talk to your local health code, there's probably some zoning deals, uh, your landlord, you know, if you're in a strip center or something like that, may have uh, some other issues or whatever, but you're not contacting the feds or anything like that. Um, this business, alcohol beverage business, you start with the feds, and then go to state, and then go to local, and then, you know, if it's a brewery or distillery, what, what's your landlord going to say about this stuff? What's the local zoning on drainage? What's the fire code? What's, you know, you're going to have, you know, OSHA, stuff like that. The layers and layers of regulation, it's just amazing. And, and the funny thing, it was actually the regulators that kind of encouraged me to go find a contractor. They are like, you know, you can cut a lot of time and effort out of this by having them, you know, someone that already has a liquor license, already has a legal premise, already zoned, all that stuff, have them produce it for you, and you don't have that. It was literally the feds that encouraged me to go that direction. And they could tell you, yes, this, this is really regulated. So I just encourage you, spend some time learning the regulations. Just... It seems monotonous, it'll make your head numb, but you gotta do it because it's gonna help you plan out 
all right, how many months are we going to be in business before I get that first bottle on the shelf anywhere or can sell that first beer through my tap room, this, that, and the other? You know, how am I going to stage these different licenses? Because you have to file federal before you can file state and before you file local. So it's a process, and you, you have to learn that regulation first to get you uh, there. Even if you decide, hey, I'm just going to pay someone to do it, uh, you still need to learn it just for your ability to plan. And that gets us to number two, which is get a good lawyer. Uh, I say also in that a good lawyer, good accountant, good tax people, a good team of specialists. On the lawyer end, I would advise you to actually find a lawyer that specializes in it. You may have a lawyer or somebody that may have helped you get through a divorce or fight some traffic tickets. While those guys are lawyers and, and probably could handle the process, pay the extra money, get you a lawyer that specializes in it. That's where we lucked out. I found a lawyer that was uh, uh, specialized in helping wineries get licensed out in California. He'd been in the business, I want to say 25, 30 years, something like that. We were able to get our license fairly quick, which was really good, uh, made my life easier. It's worth it. Hindsight being 2020, I wish I'd have also hired him to incorporate. We did the whole legal Zoom thing to save a few hundred bucks and incorporate ourselves. So, uh, technically, we incorporated in Delaware, like I said, and, and then also in Nevada. But we did it ourselves. Uh, hindsight being 2020, I'd have paid someone else to do it. Just make your life easier. Just even the simple fact of incorporating yourself is a lot of paperwork, a lot of things you have to keep in mind of, you know, set up a calendar. Or technically, you're supposed to have quarterly meetings. Technically, you're supposed to have votes. Technically, you got to make someone your treasurer, secretary, vice president. It's a lot of procedures. It's worth the extra money. Get you a good lawyer. Also, get you a good accountant and tax person. The A, the feds are always going to worry about your books and grind you through your books. And B, the way the tax get paid on some of these, again, depending on the business, whether it's a brewery or a distillery, whether you're contracting it or not, whether you're warehousing the product at any point in time, the tax payment comes due at different points and what have you, and you really need an expert to help you out there. So, so pay the money, get you uh, a good legal accounting team to help you out. Uh, number three is something, man, I can't. I can't emphasize enough because it was a harsh lesson I had to learn, and that is understand distribution. Understand how it works. Where distribution really came from, you know, 150 years ago, you didn't have a distributor. You know, most breweries were in a bar and they just sold right out, and they may sell to the bar down the street or wherever. There wasn't this distribution. And when the regulation behind it, the distribution really came about after uh, prohibition was appeal, repealed. And they wanted to really over-regulate, like, all right, we'll give you back your, bo your booze, but we're going to regulate the hell out of you. And part of it was they set up what's called the three-tier system. There's people that produce the booze, there's people that distribute the booze, and then there's us that sell the booze. You know, the, uh, think of it, a good way to think of it is like an hourglass. Wide up top, narrow middle, wide bottom. Up top is all the distilleries, breweries, wineries, etc. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of them across America, all want to sell their booze to everybody all over the place. On the bottom, the wide base, is all your bars, restaurants, nightclubs, casinos, resorts, liquor stores, grocery stores, all the, all the different places that sell booze. But in the middle, the tight little middle, is your distributors. They're usually at state, they're usually at state levels, and most states have two to three big distributors, maybe three to four smaller specialized distributors. And that's it. You have to go through them. Budweiser can't ship that beer directly from their distillery or from their brewery to the local Applebee's in your town. They have to go through the distributor. Everything has to go through the distributor. And that's where some of the money needs to go. That's where you need to plan because think about if you somehow get a meeting with one or two of the big distributors in your town. These people are also distributing things like Jack Daniels, Absolute Vodka, Budweiser, uh, Kendall Jackson Wine, you know, big brands that make them lots of money. Your little brand is not their focus, and you need to do something, if you know what I mean, to get their attention and get them motivated. You need to grease, kind of lube up the middle so you can shove your product through that bottleneck, and that's something I kind of had to learn the hard way. Um, 
And that takes us to number four, more money. Whatever you think you need for this project, whether it's half a million, 750, whatever, double it. You, you just cannot have too much money, <laughs> too much money. Bill Gates does not have too much money to start a brewery. Um, even if, you know, you got down your, let's say it's a brewery. Let's say you got down your facility, you know what equipment you need, you figured out projections, you've got your workflow, you got all that set up. You, you're perfect, you've got your recipes tight. Again, you still need to grease the wheel and get that stuff distributed. You need to do marketing. You need to come up with logos. Um, also, too, there's certain things like um, labeling cost. You never think about it, but you have to submit labels to the feds to get approved. I want to say at the time we did it, they were quoting like 2,500 bucks a label. Well, if you have three or four brands, now you announce an extra 10 grand just to get the labels approved. That's not printed, that's not put on, or that's just the government say, all right, we'll let you now put them on the bottles. Now you have to pay for the work itself and pay the labor for someone to put it on. You, you know, that's just to get it approved. So, you know, again, it's important to really know your budget, to really plan out the money, and, and raise all the money you can. Um, again, the story of Tito bootstrapping it, that's really romantic. And I wish I lived in that world. But unfortunately, it, it, his example is few and far between. You really need to raise more. Whatever you think about budgeting, whatever you think about budgeting for marketing, double that. Just you, You're going to want excess cash flow. You're, you're going to be surprised how long it takes for you to finally sell that first product to get money to come back in. More money. That's, that's the simple truth on that. And then number five, I think kind of wraps up the other four and will help you with number four, and it's a business plan. Uh, we, like I said, after I met uh, Tito, we were fired up, we were ready to go, we were like a bull in a china shop, and what we really need to do is step back, really done some research, really came up with a true business plan, not something you write down on one or two sheets. This should be something that's 30, 40 pages. This is something you should be able to project out sales for three to four years. I know it's kind of tough starting a new brand. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, I live that nightmare. But you need to go through the process. You need to really, like, really understand the entire chain of command, your entire marketing program. How are we going to market this? How are we going to create demand that forces that distributor to get motivated to sell your product or go out and tell people about it? You really got to come up with a plan. Also, you got to, in that, you got to figure out your team's responsibility how you know hardly any of these businesses are just done as one person generally a partners part of the thing that I noticed and this is not a shot at any of my partners uh, at the time but one of the things I noticed is everybody wants to be a celebrity chef no one wants to cut onions no one wants to wash dishes no one wants to need the 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 dough to make whatever pastry or everybody wants to be a celebrity chef you can't have five celebrity chefs and no one cutting onions you have to delegate. You have to have people that know the role. Uh, you have to find a bookworm to do the books or the accounting. Well, not everybody gets to go out and hand out the free samples or be the face of the company or, or get to make the stuff. And you got to, again, through the business plan process, you've got to work that out. Who does want and when and understand your role. And again, you all can't be celebrity chefs. Highly, highly important. Uh, also, too, I think if you get that planned out before, people know the rules, people know the expectations, and you're going to get less feelings hurt, you're going to have a more organized thing, and you're going to step on less toes. Uh, I would suggest, let's say you're a home brewer and you really think you've got three or four beer recipes really nailed down, you're wanting to go pro, you're wanting to start that nano brewery. I would take a couple of weeks, don't worry about beer, and just spend a year on learning about business plans, not even writing a business plan learning about business plans, reading actual real business plans. Find sample brewery, winery, cidery business plans and read through them. Just get that process down. Be able to know what a real good business plan looks like and then start working on it. And get that done before you do anything else, before you start calling the feds, before you start looking for, you know, leasing, you know, lease space. Uh, before you contact a contracting company if you want to go that route. Get that business plan done first. Read it, reread it, recheck it. You can't be too organized in this process. 
So those are the five things I learned throughout this process. Hopefully you take a little bit from that. Uh, next, real quick, I want, I want to give you some websites to go to that may help you out. Uh, before we do that, though, I do want to recommend uh, a great place to come and just network, find out a little bit about the business, and also just have a good time is the annual nightclub and bar show. We're shooting this in fall of 2020. Uh, we're still in the pandemic mode. Uh, the show that was supposed to happen in March of this year got canceled. That's when the whole COVID thing went kind of crazy. Hopefully in 2021 there's a show, but they have it out in the Las Vegas Convention Center every year. And it's just a ton of people in the nightclub, bar, spirit, beer, wine, you know, in the, in, the, in the industry. And what's been growing, I've been going there on and off for about 20 years. And what's really been growing at the show is they have a couple aisles now. They're new products. If you, you know, the newest vodka, the newest energy drink, the newest liqueur, you know, cinnamon liqueur, whatever it is. And they have a lot of new brands. And that's a great place to go meet people that are where you want to get. Um, if they have a new product, they're, you know, now looking at. If they're at something like the nightclub and bar show, they're not just selling in their local. They're wanting to at least be multi-state. A lot of the products may not be distributed nationally in all 50 states, but they may be in 10, 15, 20 states, what have you. And a lot of times, the guy that actually started the company or the woman that's the head brewer wire, they are there at the booth talking and pushing their products. So it's a great way to interact and talk to them, kind of see what they're doing from marketing-wise, how they're you know, working through their distribution, um, the lessons they learned. There's also at night, a lot of times uh, after the show's over, there's a lot of mixers where you meet people all throughout the, the whole chain, whether it's distributors, whether it's bar owners. That's a great way to meet bar owners and ask them, hey, would you be open to this type of product? What, what are the kids drinking these days? Whatever. So uh, let me put in a plug for the nightclub and bar show. It's great, you know, way. And you get to come to Vegas and go, you know, hang out at a, at a bar show. And it's hard to beat. So real quick, let me uh, give you a few websites to check out. They'll help you out. First, ttb.gov. That is the Trade and Taxation Bureau. That's who regulates alcohol federally. You need to just spend a ton of time on that website. Again, even if you're hiring a lawyer, you need to go through that website and kind of learn the basics of regulations so again you can get some ideas. You can decide whether you want to make your own product or go to a contractor or which is easier. Uh, I've got to give the TTB credit. When I worked with them they were really good about answering emails, answering any kind of questions. They were pretty quick on the responses. They were very honest. Like I said, they were honest to me in the sense of like, hey your life would be easier if you just contracted that out. Which I thought was kind of cool uh, that they did that. Uh, also on their site, at the time I used it, and I believe it's still this way today, they have links to your state liquor agency. So you can kind of go through there to get to your state agency too. And when you file, you have to file first federally, then state, then local. So that's probably a place you need to start regulation wise. Uh, next is a website called distilling.com. It's the home of the American Distilling Institute. It um, is a great place to learn about the business if you want to start a distillery. Uh, let's say you want to make your own bourbon, something like that. Uh, they have a lot of online courses, but they also offer live seminars, stuff like that. Uh, a chance to really actually distill on real equipment, real commercial equipment, which is uh, even if you're a quote unquote home game player, home distiller, uh, what have you, it's one thing using a five gallon still on your stove, and it's another thing, you know, with a 500 gallon <laughs> still or, or what have you. So. Uh, and they have different certifications and classes, like I said there. Also, too, they have great forums, and I believe they even have like a marketplace where you can find used equipment or whatever. And like I said, there's a lot of failures like I was out there, so maybe you can find a good deal on equipment, if anything, to save you some money. Uh, the next website is brewerassociation.com, or, or .org, that is the home site for the Brewers Association. Uh, I challenge you to go to too many microbreweries, nanobreweries, brew pubs, where you don't see by the front door, the, the big BA, the Brewers Association sticker, and I believe it's uh, yellow and brown in, in color. Uh, it's an association more for the actual professional brewers, but I do believe they allow non-professionals now that have like a non-professional membership, but they do a ton of classwork, a certification books, you know, like, like real hardcore books on like yeast flocculation and, you know, uh, water, you know, your uh, water treatment programs and sanitation programs, this, that, and the other. 
Um, they also have a forum and I believe a marketplace too where you can find used equipment. Uh, really good site. Next is ciderassociation.org. It's home to the U.S. Association of Cider Makers. A lot of you out there, again, maybe on the distillery brewery end, but let me make a pitch for wineries, cideries, and meteries because a lot of them are, are regulated at state level more as, an as a farm or agriculture. Let's say you wanted to make apple cider and you had a cider orchard. Let's say you're a farmer, but you want to get in that. You could get a lot of tax breaks, a lot of regulation breaks, uh, because you're technically a farmer or agriculture or whatever. Um, so uh, those guys, you know, have some advantages that the brewers and the distillers don't, and it may be something you want to look into. And ciderassociation.org is a great site to find that out and everything. And also you're... You, a lot of that's more also to kind of state and local too on, the, on some of the tax breaks and regulation breaks you get on those uh, type businesses. And uh, last but not least, homebrewerassociation.com. It's the home of the American Homebrewer Association. I was a member for a long time. Uh, you may be one of those homebrewers out there that has three to four recipes that you really nailed. Your buddies say it's great and you're thinking, time for me to start a nano brewery. Um, this is a great place to keep learning about brewing really sharpen those recipes but also prepare yourself there's a lot of people that are in a similar situation that that in their mind they're ready to go pro also one thing i've noticed in the homebrewing world there's kind of an interesting spot now uh there's guys I, i'll use me as an example kind of a home hobbyist we brew anywhere between one and five gallon batches maybe once a month once every other you know something like that and then there's the really hardcore home brewer that now has their own brew systems you know, has proper conical fermenters. You know, they've changed a, a keg fridge now to, you know, a fermentation, you, you know, a wort chiller. You know, really advanced pieces of equipment. And on the professional side, breweries have gotten smaller and smaller. You used to never see anything below a seven barrel system. And it was questionable why you'd have something that small. Now you have nano breweries literally starting off with a one barrel system. Or I want to say there's some legally they even have half barrel systems. They may be in the back of a pizza shop or whatever, that kind of arrangement. But those size systems are really for big home brewers. So there's a kind of a spot in between this, somewhere between home brewing and pro. And that's where you'll find a lot of these people at the home brewers, you know, association website. And a lot of those, you know, you can find again recipe ideas, used equipment. You talk to people that are similar to you. Uh, they have a lot of conferences. Great way to interact uh, with people. Great website uh, to check out. And last but not least, I'll give you one more little uh, little bit of info, and I'll have all the links uh, down below for this. It's a book I read. I've read a couple times. I wish I had it before I started my business. And it comes from us from Entrepreneur Magazine. It's called Start Your Own Microbrewery, Distillery, or Cidery. You can tell it's not the thickest book. It's not a end all be all to the topic, but they have a lot of stories examples from specific people that became successful. They have the story of Tita's Vodka, uh, Jim Cook with Sam Adams, uh, I believe Sam Calgione with Dogfish Head, several other examples of different cideries, meteries, what have you. More importantly, they get you to thinking about how to organize your thoughts, get you, you know, mind, you know, again, a lot of people think, well, I make a really good beer. All I got to do is just make more of it and then sell it. Well, it's not quite that simple, and they talk about certain things like, again, figuring out your production run, what's your capacity, um, should I have a tap room, should I have a pub, or a, a pub or you know, a restaurant tied with the deal, should I self-distribute, should I just sell kegs, should I sell bottles, cans, really gets you to think about the whole process, and it's a good book, and like I said, I'll leave a link down below. Well, that's about it on topic. Uh, I do want to make an offer. I hope, I hope you found this information useful, and I hope you can learn from my mistakes. Uh, I do want to make an offer, anybody out there watching this, if you want to start a brewery, distillery, what have you, and want uh, have any kind of questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section, contact me on the Twitter page. I'm glad to let you know what I know or the mistakes I've made. Like I said, I'm not the end-all, be-all on the topic by far. I just know how to fail, 
But again, that maybe will help you uh, not to fail. So feel free to contact me anytime. I'll help you as much as I can. And with that being said, I hope you liked the video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please leave them in the comment section. Or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. And I think this is when I need a drink, and we'll do this. All right. As I like to say, until next time, bottoms up.